Welcome everyone to the Characteristics of Plants lecture. You might be wondering, Mr. Ramawi, plants, seriously, come on. Well, believe it or not, they are the most important thing. Without plants, there would be very little oxygen on Earth, and without oxygen, we wouldn't survive, since that's what we breathe. So let's learn a little bit about plants and their main characteristics. At first, plants might not seem all that exciting, and you might wonder, why must I learn about plants? But plants are so important for life. They are producers, which means that they are the main support for food webs. Many medications that we have today are derived from plants. They produce oxygen for us to breathe by the photosynthesis that they do. Not to say that everything that does photosynthesis is necessarily a plant. Algae, for example, it does photosynthesis and it is not a plant. But plants do play a major role in oxygen production. You know how there are many different types of animals. Well, there are many different types of plants as well. To get to plant structure, we need to outline two major plant categories, vascular and non-vascular. Recall that in the human body, your vascular system includes arteries and veins. Well, plants don't have arteries, or blood for that matter. When we're talking about a vascular system in plants, we're talking about two major types of tubes or vessels called the xylem and phloem. The xylem carries water. Xylem is found throughout a vascular plant. Water is absorbed from the roots of a vascular plant and carried upwards. Roots are specially designed to help anchor plants and also to absorb the water found in the soil that they are in. The phloem carries sugars, which are typically produced in the leaves of the plants during photosynthesis. This sugar is their food source that plants make in photosynthesis. It needs to be carried throughout the plant. The phloem might start with a P, but you know it has that same F sound that food has, so it helps me remember that it carries the plant's food. If a plant is non-vascular, it does not have vessels like the xylem and phloem. However, it still needs water and it still produces sugar. It can't carry water upwards in the xylem because it doesn't have one. That means non-vascular plants typically are limited in size. A giant tree needs a xylem for water transport. Uh, water is being carried against gravity. Non-vascular plants instead get their water by osmosis, kind of like soaking up water like a sponge. A great example of a non-vascular plant is moss. So remember, vascular plants, they have xylem and phloem, vascular tissue, and non-vascular plants, they don't. Much of a plant structure is actually designed to facilitate photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the ability to make sugar, the plant's own food source, from sunlight. We cannot do this. You might be able to go in the kitchen to make a sandwich, but you're just preparing your food. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could go out in your backyard and sunbathe and conjure up a sandwich in your stomach? Our little analogy is not perfect, but you can get what a big deal photosynthesis is. If you understand the importance of this function for plants, you can really understand many structure adaptations that plants have. Photosynthesis needs three major reactants to work. Water, light, and carbon dioxide. Now water, we mentioned already how a plant can get its water in different ways, depending on whether they're vascular or non-vascular. So what about the other two reactants, the light and the carbon dioxide? So starting with the sunlight, how does plant structure deal with that? Well, plant cells have organelles called chloroplasts. They are the site of photosynthesis, so they help capture light energy for the process of photosynthesis. This is a complicated process that is made up of a light-dependent reaction and a light-independent reaction, also called the Kelvin cycle. It's a big enough process that we'll have to have another video clip to cover that. But the leaf structure is designed to capture this light energy with their chloroplast. The other reactant on our photosynthesis checklist is carbon dioxide. 
So how does the structure of plants help them obtain carbon dioxide? First of all, please realize that plants do something in addition to photosynthesis called cellular respiration, just like you. And they do need the gas oxygen, but they typically produce more oxygen than they use, which makes them helpful as oxygen producers. For photosynthesis, plants need the gas CO2, carbon dioxide. This is the gas, conveniently, that we exhale, which means that we breathe this gas out. Many plants have these fascinating little openings, pores really, called stomata. Stomata is the plural, and stoma is the singular form of that word. Stomata are typically found on the bottom of leaves, and in some species, they're actually on the top. Stomata have a major role in gas exchange. Gases can flow in through the stomata and out through the stomata, and the CO2 that enters is really needed for photosynthesis. There's only one little problem. The plant can't keep those stomata open all the time. Why? Well, water will escape. And remember, plants need water too for photosynthesis. So the plant has to determine whether to open or close its stomata. It does this with the help of guard cells. If guard cells have the stomata open, it gets the gases it needs, but it can lose water. If guard cells have the stomata closed, it gets to save its water, but then it can't get any gases. At night, most plants, with a few exceptions that we'll talk about towards the end, close their stomata because they can conserve water. At night, they can't do much photosynthesis because there's not much sunlight. So what's the point in keeping stomata open? During sunny days, most plants tend to open their stomata to get the gases they need to do the photosynthesis. But if the day gets way too hot and the plant is low on water, it may close its stomata. Different plant species have different kinds of adaptations in their structure to help them survive. Because if one thing is true about plants, they are survivors. Here are some great examples of plant structure adaptations that help them with various functions. Plants that have to conserve water, they tend to have very thin leaves, so they don't have much surface area, and that way they don't lose that much water. Think about pine trees with their skinny pine needles, or think about the plants that live in the desert. Remember how we said that most plants close their stomata at night? Well, some desert plants have adapted by opening their stomata at night when it's not ridiculously hot. And they have a specialized way to store the gases they need for the daytime. This allows them to close their stomata during the day to prevent water loss during the hot desert sun. Plants that have a lot of access to water, but maybe are shaded by lots of taller plants in the jungle, they might have really broad, wide leaves so they can soak up as much sun as possible it's hard to live in someone else's shadow. Since there's plenty of water, these big-leaved plants don't have to worry about all the surface area losing water because there's plenty of water to go around. Or, have you heard about carnivorous plants, like the Venus flytrap or the pitcher plant? These plants still do photosynthesis to make their sugar. But carnivorous plants also have the ability to digest insects, typically by using special enzymes and a juice that they secrete. These plants tend to live in areas where the soil is low in nitrogen. Plants and other organisms use nitrogen to make proteins. Insects are a great way to supplement this nitrogen need. If you ever look at the ingredients in plant fertilizer, you'll find that fertilizers are typically high in nitrogen. And you know when people hang up mistletoe? So sweet, right? You're supposed to get a kiss under it. Is it terribly ironic that you are hanging out a potentially parasitic plant that uses its roots to steal nutrients and water from its host plant? Hmm. Plants also have some amazing reproductive adaptations, but we have another clip for that. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious. All right, so let's get into a little bit more detail about the main characteristics of plants. Firstly, plants are eukaryotic. They have membrane-bound organelles. Secondly, they are multicellular organisms. And thirdly, they are autotrophs, meaning they make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. Well, just like the video said, plants are classified into non-vascular and vascular categories. 
non-vascular plants are low-growing because they lack vascular tissues. They do not have roots. They live near water and they are supported by cell walls. Some examples of non-vascular plants that you might see every now and then are moss, liverworts, and hornworts. I think the most common one that we can all recognize is moss. It grows on rocks, grows on trees, grows on the ground, doesn't really get too tall, it's very slippery. So if you want to remember what a non-vascular plant looks like, remember moss. Mosses are found in cracks of sidewalks, tree trunks, and rocks. Liverworts are named after their shape, and they are also found on moist rocks or soil among streams. Hornworts are named after their sporophytes that look like horns, and they are found in moist soil mixed with grass. So let's talk about vascular plants. They possess vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem. They are supported by vascular tissue, and they transport materials through the vascular tissue. This allows them to grow very, very tall. The three main examples we have are ferns, sunflowers, and horsetails. Fern contains many fronds, as you can see in the picture, and they reproduce through spores, and they are a common household plant. So if you have a fern plant in your house, or one of your friends has a fern plant in their house, take a look under the leaves and see if the fern is fertile. Sunflowers are supported and possess vascular tissue, and they reproduce by seeds. We eat sunflower seeds. So if you ever wanted to remember how sunflower seeds reproduce, remember that they produce seeds and we eat those seeds, and they are delicious. Horsetails reproduce by spores. They resemble small branch of a pine tree. And they have existed for over 100 million years. And if you have existed for over 100 million years, you are a survivor. These plants know what they are doing. So vascular seeded plants have vascular tissue reproduced by seeds and these seeds are dispersed by animals, wind, and water. The seeds go through a germination process while they are a young embryo. If you wonder how they are dispersed by animals, the animals would eat the seed as part of a fruit, like an apple for example. And once the animal defecates, the seed will be defecated and planted and fertilized wherever the bird decided to do its business. So we have gymnosperms, 
and we have angiosperms when we speak about seed plants or seeded plants. Gymnosperms produce naked seeds. These seeds are not covered or protected by a shell, such as the sunflower seed. Angiosperms produce seeds in a closed fruit. So an apple, an orange, a grapefruit, things of that nature. Angiosperm. Within the category of angiosperms, we have monocots and we have dicots. A monocot has three or more petals, excuse me, three petals or multiple of three. So it could have three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, and so on petals. They are long and slender leaves with parallel veins. They're very straight. They have scattered bundles of vascular tissue and one cotyledon. Dicots have only four or five petals with, and the leaves have branching veins. As you can see in the picture there, branching veins. Circular pattern of vascular tissue and they have two cotyledons. And there, there we go, there we are. The basic characteristics of plants. Gymnosperms, angiosperms, monocots, dicots, vascular, non-vascular. We will go into more detail as the chapter continues. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me.